My name is Elvira Matenia. I'm professor of sociology and liberal studies at the New School for Social Research and the director of the Transregional Center for Democratic Studies. And wherever you are, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to a talk by the distinguished anthropologist Arjuna Padurai, whom many of us remember as a resident of our village, our Greenwich Village <laughs> campus here in downtown Manhattan. This is the first guest lecture in this year's Transregional Dialogues Fellowship Program, which we've entitled, we at Transregional Center for Democratic Studies, and entitled Rethinking the Past, Reimagining the Future. Uh, Transregional Dialogues uh, is a non residential yet highly interactive collaborative project that brings together 22 fellows. More specifically, doctoral students in the social science, well, broadly understood social science, um, uh, from um, half of them, about half of them are, are now in the war shattered Ukraine. The other half are international doctoral students from various parts of the world, and most of them are studying here at the new school. Those of you who want to know a little bit more about the program, there is a link and there is chat, a link on the chat. For us here at the, at the, at the new school, this is an important learning moment. Um, and just as in the case of the conversatorium in Ukraine, which we just concluded, um, we wanted to share this moment with, a, with the wider public, hence a webinar format, which is difficult, which is problematic, but we are all here. so. I'm, I'm pleased that it's happening. Um, so webinar, some of our events are in a webinar, had to be in a webinar uh, format. Um, one of the transregional dialogues working groups uh, concerned with the conditions of post-coloniality uh, have asked me sheepishly whether it would be possible at all to meet Arjuna Padurai. We tried, I tried, <laughs> Professor Padurai gra graciously agreed and he's a very busy person. And so today he opens our talk series. Arjuna Padura is a distinguished visiting professor at Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle, Germany. Um, he is a professor uh, emeritus in media, culture and communication at NYU, New York University. Um, he has honorary appointment at Humboldt University in Berlin and Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And although it seems like only yesterday, that we had him with us here at the New School as a senior advisor on global initiatives, the John Dewey distinguished, uh, distinguished professor in the social sciences and the provost of and, and vice president for academic affairs. It was really almost a decade ago, more actually some dozen years ago. I do remember myself, he's absolutely remarkable. And for me personally, inc very, very inspiring talk he gave at the New School which helped me articulate my own, my own question and my own kind of agenda. I, I brought from that lecture the question, what does it take for, for, the, for people's backs to straighten up? What are the alternatives to violent solutions and to despair? What in today's world are the conditions that generate dignity rather than humiliation, trust, rather than suspicion? And what does it take for hopeful alternatives to spring up and take root? Okay, you, you, you could find the link to Arjun's full bio on the chat. Let me just add some here, some of his works, which are still widely read and taught. We all teach them and, 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 and in the graduate programs everywhere, especially that they, they were translated into, into, into French, into Spanish, German, Portuguese, Japanese, Chinese, Turkish. And um, so here are the titles, Fear of Small Things, an essay on the geography of anger. Published already in 2006 by Duke. Modernity of Large, perhaps the, 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 the most widely circulated, uh, circulating at the university's book, uh, Cultural Dimensions of Globalization. Um, another one, The Future as a Cultural Fact, Essays on the Global Condition. And um, banking on words, the failure of language in the age of derivative finance. His most recent book, published just before uh, COVID struck all of us, um, a co authored with Neta Alexander, uh, is entitled Failure. And it was um, 
published by the Polity Press in 2019. Today, today Professor uh, Apadurai will be talking about post-colonialism, imperialism, and the global turn to the right. Later on, he will be joined by three fellows of the program who will engage in the discussion or perhaps simply ask question, uh, uh, questions um, based on his talk. Um, Professor Abadurai, the screen, however shaky, <laughs> is yours. <laughs> well, okay, great. Well, thanks, uh, uh, Elzbieta, and also to the other Elzbieta, aka Lala, <laughs> uh, a, a wonderful uh, uh, name she has for email purposes, Lala Pop. It's a kind of Andy Warhol-like name, but anyway, it keeps the two Elizabeth <laughs> apart. Uh, I'm of course very happy to be here. Indeed, I've known about the uh, center, uh, for democratic studies that uh, has been mentioned already that Elzbieta created. Uh, and I learned about it when I first came to the new school in uh, the early 2000s. You know, it's uh, Elzbieta- 2004? Is, when was it? 2004. Yeah. So it's uh, almost 20 years. It's a long time. Uh, but it was a very uh, remarkable time, both for the the difficulties that the new school faced, but also I think certain changes mm -hmm. that happened, which I hope and believe I was able to contribute to, which are continue in spite of uh, other things which are less uh, uh, memorable, but uh, or less uh, happy memories uh, for the university. I mean, not uh, just me personally. But uh, I'm, I'm continuing to be closely connected to, to the new school and to many friends there, including you, uh, Elzbieta, and I'm, of course, our, our dear friend Aryan and others connected to. Arjun, is, I, I should add, I, should, I didn't say it, I just didn't want yes. to take time. It's on the board of the social research and we are tremendously uh, lucky to have you with us, even though you are in well, Berlin. Oh, yes, it's, it's a great, uh, another connection as is, uh, but since these are linked also to scholars at risk and to the overall public commitments of the of the new school for a very long time. So it's great to be here. So I'm going to just go, I'm going to read because otherwise it's hard to keep track of the clock and of time uh, and uh, try to get through my seven or eight pages uh, in, in enough time to leave uh, time and room for talk and still allow me to uh, gently say goodbye, perhaps instead of uh, 7.30 my time, which is 1.30 your time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes after, but not much more than that. So uh, it is in standard usage in the Western academic world, the term post-colonialism is used to refer to the ideas and movements that emerged at the end of World War II in the new decolonizing nations of Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. And it became shaped into a theory of global emancipation articulated by Franz Fanon, Aimé César, and Leopold Senghor, and later turned into academic concepts by, among other people, Stuart Hall, Gayatri Spivak, Homi Baba, Ashil Mbembe, and indirectly by Edward Said and many other scholars, mostly from literary and cultural studies who are influenced by these earlier major thinkers, Fanon, Cesar, Senghor, et cetera. In Latin America, where the critiques of imperialism and colonialism and colonization emerged first in sociology and political science rather than literary and cultural studies. In ideas such as dependency theory, things took a different form in which the idea of the indigenous and decolonial were generated by scholars such as Anibal Quijano and now are very actively promoted by uh, 
Walter Mignolo, his collaborators, and others writing today. Gradually, the term postcolonialism has lost its links to the global South and is actively used in many context, contexts, including those of Europe and the US, where immigrants, uh, subaltern or marginalized populations uh, are rightly seen as being victims of various empires, such as the Tsarist Empire, uh, the Ottomans, the Habsburgs, and the Empire of the United States. So the term has widened in its reach. This is the background against which we need to ask what the ideas of post-colonialism may have to offer to the study of the global swing to the right, the recent global swing to the right, where well-established dictators like Putin and Xi Jinping have been joined by India's Modi, Brazil's Bolsonaro, uh, till recently the USA's Trump, Hungary's Orban, and many other recently anointed autocrats. Some of us contributed to a uh, volume, which I hope you will read sometime, called The Great Regression, originally in German, The Grosse Regression, uh, published by Zorkampf, very soon after Trump's term in office. So the book came out early in 2019 to discuss this global swing uh, to, the right, to the right. I wrote in that volume, I contributed an essay. Uh, which argues that part of the reason for this global swing to the right, which combines populism, authoritarianism, and xenophobia, I use the phrase democracy fatigue. In other words, people were fed up with democracy. They didn't want to wait. They didn't want slow processes. They didn't want deliberation, they didn't want delay. They wanted results now. And these people in different parts of the world said they would give them results now. In almost no case have they delivered, of course. But that promise was very appealing due to a kind of fatigue with the slowness of liberal democratic processes. That was my explanation, but there were many other authors in that volume. So I urge you to read that including uh, the New School's own Nancy Frazier, including uh, uh, the uh, uh, Zizek, including various distinguished journalists, scholars, and analysts uh, from, from Europe and beyond. It's a wonderful volume, which somehow didn't get quite the attention it should have. So I urge you to look at it if you wish. Uh, so others in this volume advance different explanations for the global swing to the right, involving the cruelties of neoliberal capitalism, the growing hysteria about migrants, the return of older nationalisms, and the fears of global projects, diseases, and fashions as threats to national integrity. In all of these, in all these theories, there was a tendency to focus on mass phenomena, populist hysterias, and crowd behavior. What was less noticed was the strange role of elites in many of these authoritarian societies in supporting this global swing to the right. So here I transition to an idea which I call the revolt of the elites. So here I'm playing, of course, with the, the title of the classic book from early in the 20th century by the Spanish thinker Ortega y Gasset, which he called the revolt of the masses. In other words, his worry was that the crowd was beginning to enter politics and therefore the, the key values of liberal democracy were going to be crushed. Now I would reverse this slightly and say what we have is a revolt of the elites. Uh, and I want to explain this to you. I return to this because I think the 20th century has exhausted the major forms of mass revolt. And that we have entered a new epoch, epoch, which is characterized by the revolt of the elites. These revolting elites, pun intended, 
are those who support, surround, promote, and flatter the new uh, autocracies of Modi, Trump, Erdogan, Bolsonaro, Johnson, Orban, and many others who have created what could be called populism from above, where the people are electoral tools for a mass exit from democracy. And I'm very interested here also, I, and I've developed that in my article on democracy fatigue, the ideas of the great Albert Hirschman about loyalty and uh, uh, voice and exit. What we are seeing is a mass exit from democracy through democratic means, that is through electoral means. So why call this behavior of the new, new auto, uh, autocratic elites a revolt rather than simply, for example, predatory capitalism, cronyism, neoliberalism in its late, latest guise, disaster capitalism, all of which are available terms. Who are these new elites and what are they revolting against? First, they are revolting against all the other elites whom they despise, hate, and fear. Liberal elites, media elites, secular elites, cosmopolitan elites, Harvard elites, WASP elites, older economic elites, intellectuals, artists, and academics whose, cate whose uh, who, uh, and these categories are pooled from which different national populists choose the appropriate national and cultural uh, menu. So this is an elite which disguises its own elitism in a discourse of anti-elitism. Second, this revolt is against all those who are believed to have betrayed the real elites and captured power illegitimately. Blacks in the USA, Muslims and secularists in India, leftists and gays in Brazil, dissenters, NGOs and journalists in Russia, religious, cultural and economic minorities in Turkey, immigrants, workers and other and unionists in the United Kingdom. This is a revolt by those who think that they are true elites against those they consider usurpers or false elites. Thirdly, the revolt of these new elites is against the claims that have bound them in the epoch, it, the, the chains that have bound them in the epoch of liberal democracy. They hate liberty, equality, and fraternity, except for themselves. They hate checks and balances, which they view as illegitimate restrictions on their freedom to act without restraint. They hate regulations of any type, especially of corporate privileges, which they see as a conspiracy against capitalism, which they view as their private jurisdiction. And above all, they hate deliberation and procedural rationality since they involve listening, patience, and adherence to collective rationalities. They also don't, do not believe in the separation of powers except when their friends control the legislature and the judiciary. What this means most simply is that the revolt of the new elites is against democracy. That is the revolt. But the twist is that this revolt is undertaken in the name of the people. In other words, the modern idea of the people has been completely split from the idea of demos and democracy. This is a revolt in the sense that uprisings to seize power always revolts, but not a revolution. So notice I use the word revolt, not revolution, intended to change anything in the fundamental order of polity or economy. This revolt is the effort by one elite to replace another. All this might seem overly general and historically familiar if we do not ask a few sociological questions. What is the nature of this new elite? What defines its conditions of entry? Who speaks for it? What are its social roots? These questions bring us to specific societies and states, for example, to the USA under Trump, who I remind you has not by any means disappeared from US politics or US uh, society. Uh, the same can be asked about all these other countries, Hungary, Turkey, uh, of course, Russia, China, and so on, namely, 
It's a sociological question. Where do these elites come from? What do they want? Who are their friends? Who are their supporters? How are they able to hijack the instruments of power? So we, there's a big inquiry, which I won't undertake today. I have done it in some detail for India, but you need to ask this question with any right-wing autocracy that you may be particularly interested in or concerned uh, about. In the, in the Indian case, uh, we have a lot of information about the way uh, the current prime minister, Narendra Modi, has enlisted the cause of Hinduism to advance his own revolt against secular elites, westernized elites, uh, and, so, and so on. Uh, it's a big and important story in which the main victims are Muslims, but you all may not be aware, uh, uh, as some of us are, that what Modi is conducting is a wholesale attack on the constitution, on the judiciary and so on, much more direct than anything Trump could dream of because Modi is 100 times smarter. So what is going on is the undoing of the constitution. And the constitution is the pillar of India's democracy. So it's not just about Muslim xenophobia, nationalism, corruption, and so on. It's much, much deeper. So in the Indian case, the elite is really trying to redo the constitution and wreck the constitution that exists. I propose to you that actually many of these right-wing authoritarians, in fact, don't like constitutions, any form of democratic constitution, because it puts uh, restraints in their way. But I will leave that for you uh, to think about. I want to move slowly towards a, uh, a conclusion and to say that if the elites who characterize many of the world's new populist autocracies are populist from above, the people who, in whose name and with whose a burning consent. They are undoing many democratic structures, values, and traditions. Who are these people? So it's fine to focus on elites, but we also have to ask about who is giving them consent. Of course, in political theory, in, in sociology, and in history, the question of consent is a very big one because very few people rule by raw power. This is a, a something I do want to say, that whether it's Stalin or Putin today, whether it's Xi Jinping or whether it's Mao, whether it's Hitler or anybody else, there is consent. No tyranny can work by power alone. This is our big human embarrassment. Where did the consent come from? Nobody responds to raw power. People have to be drawn in. So of course we have answers, propaganda and so on, but Everybody issues propaganda. Why does some propaganda work? Why does some propaganda work sometimes? Why does it work for some people and not for others? This is so it's not simple to say, oh, it's propaganda. We do have to ask how people sign on. And what I would say in the Indian case, and I'm almost finished with my comments now, which I've looked at closely, is that what has happened because of social media. Uh, because of the capture of social media to a large extent by, in the Indian case, the state and the ruling party, who have a very sophisticated IT cell, so they are very clever at using social media, is that while prosperity has not trickled down, hate has trickled down. So people at the bottom feel ready to hate just the way their leaders hate. So they are open in a way to that kind of trickling down. And they think, I think there's a sense that if the practices of exclusion, minoritization, public violence, which are encouraged by the ruling party are enacted by them in a kind of trickle down hatred, that maybe prosperity will also follow like that. Maybe they will become prosperous like their leaders. Of course, it's a completely bankrupt hope because these leaders are deeply corrupt. And we know that in India, but I'd venture to say, of course, in uh, Russia and elsewhere. And I want to conclude my observations. In other words, that there is a kind of exit from democracy that elites who want to replace other elites are very uh, responsible for it. 
but their audience, the people who follow them, are also signing on because otherwise all this would be stopped. My concluding thought is also uh, something that I put forward because it's an old, old hobby horse of mine. And that is that behind many, many problems of the last century or even two centuries is nationalism. I have nothing really good to say about it, honestly. And I've been thinking about it for 25 years. Uh, uh, you know, yes, it's good at this time, it's good for Palestinians when they're struggling here, there, but very soon it reveals itself. And I hear Ron Arendt and others, and I've written about this in the book, Fear of Small Numbers, that basically nationalism at the end is an ethnic idea. You can call it what you like. You can call it constitutional patriotism. You can do this, you can do that. It is ethnic. I am different from you. And at the end of the day, if you are in my space, you have to go. You have to either be killed or removed. So nationalism is not a great recipe. And I end by saying that somewhere in this story of colonialism, imperialism, and so on, is you can come out of those terrible things. You can be decolonial, you can be emancipated, and so on. But then there is something waiting for you, which is nationalism. And today, nationalism <laughs> is no good, whether it's in 1940 or 1920 or 1980. But sooner or later, it shows its true colors. And those colors are ugly. And the ugliness is very clear with Xi Jinping, with Putin, and so on. But I say, since many of you are deeply concerned as I am about Ukraine, my concern is, let's say there's a settlement or Russia walks away. I mean, it's a bit hard to imagine, but let's say it does. OK, so we have Zelensky, we have Ukraine. We have Okay, now we won because we were a, a united nation, they, namely we were na nationalists, the world supported us. Okay, now what next? Uh, and my feeling is that day the test will come. Will there be a minority in Ukraine which will be pursued? Will there be a turn to xenophobia? Who will you kill at that time? At that, I don't say this as a flat prediction, but I say this is a concern. So we should think very carefully even with all our hearts, you know, supporting the struggles in Ukraine, to remember that when this is settled, if we are all still alive, there will still be a question, how can we defend territory, sovereignty, et cetera, in the nation state model without finding another enemy? So I stop there and ask you for two minutes uh, recess uh, and I'll be right back. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Arjun. So um, indeed, we will have the two minutes recess. And um, let me just only say, um, to take this two minutes, um, that we will be joined now. Lala will invite um, three of our fellows um, who will have a time and opportunity to really engage with, um, with Arjun. Um, one person. Roxolana Makar, I will introduce them in a second because I want uh, Arjun also to hear a little bit about them um, very briefly. Roxolana Makar is, uh, I believe, this, at this moment in Kiev. We did receive an email earlier today that there is no electricity wherever she is. She could, could not connect. I hope that she eventually found, oh yes, I see Roxolana. It's kind of, yes, good, good. I'm, I, 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 was, I was very concerned of what's, what, you know, how are we going to, to do that? We all had all sorts of issues by, by arriving today to this meeting. So Roxolana, Roxolana, are you in, um, in Kiev? I'm in Lviv right now. Oh, you are in and Lviv. I, okay. Yeah, and I had power on like five minutes before the lecture, so I was incredibly lucky. <laughs> okay, so you did hear the lecture. That's that's fantastic. Good, good. Um, so I will introduce you a little bit later in a second. Welcome. And um, our second person, the second fellow, is from Turkey. And uh, I think all, all those all those countries were mentioned, of course, in in. Uh, in the in the in the talk, uh, Nuri Jan Akin, we call him Jan, uh, is a doctoral student in sociology, and he is in New York with us at the time. I know that he's in New York because he's teaching a class <laughs> um, at Lang College. Or Lang Co uh, College. I again, I will say a few more words about him when uh, once we uh, have um, 
back uh, um, Arjun with us. Um, and the third person that we invited to, to join Arjun today, just as- I am back. Oh, wonderful, uh, wonderful. It's Malkas uh, Toria from Georgia. So I'm going to introduce now um, uh, Arjun, our three fellows. Um, and there was a drama uh, uh, prior to that event, uh, the uh, uh, Norok Solana, who is our fellow, and it's right there and, and in that gallery right here, um, uh, and who is right now in Lviv, um, did not have electricity, didn't have access to to, to internet, uh, therefore didn't have access to internet. And then only 10 minutes before the, the, your talk, she was able to find a place. And so she's with us. Ruxolana Makar is an independent scholar um, in cultural studies. Um, I understand, Roxolana, you've been associated with the Kiev Mohila Academy, right? Yeah, Kiev Mohila Academy is an extraordinary organization, institution, the very first, um, very first uh, uh, university, private, I guess, a civic initiative, initiative of independent and dissident scholars established in Kiev after after the uh, the, the emergence of U Ukraine uh, as an independent state. Uh, Roxolana um, works on colonial legacy of the Russian ballet. Um, that she argues is one of the most powerful tools. One moment, I found this on the web. Jesus, what's that? Okay, um, so um, she she argues that this is one of uh, the most powerful one of the most powerful uh, tools in Russian cultural policy uh, and policies today, and and she is also trying aiming to to redefine the place of Ukrainian ballet in that situation, um, in the colonial legacy, discovering very early um, uh, Ukrainian ballet in the short period between the end of the Russian Empire and the emergence of the, of the Soviet Union. Um, that's Roxolana. Uh, Nuri uh, Khan, Jan Akin, I should know better, he, he is really Jan, is Turkish. Um, uh, he is a Turkish doctoral student um, uh, at NSSR. Who is um, who is also uh, has also has a second specialization in historical studies, and he's and 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 he's his doctoral dissertation and the stuff that he's working right now on, um, uh, his work is in, is, is is in his work he's engaged with um, with the issue of of religious figures in early Turkish Republic. He has a very nice title, I have thesis even if tentative. It's, um, it says hidden in plain sight, religious figures in early Turkish Republic. Malka Storia is our third fellow who's going to join uh, um, us today um, and mostly join, uh, join Arjun. And Malkas is from Georgia. Now, this is Georgia in Caucasus. Um, he's professor, uh, associate professor actually in Georgia of, uh, in history, uh, uh, at the Ilya University in BDC, but he is uh, um, a doctoral candidate at the at the at NSSR in sociology right now, and um, he's uh, he is um, he is uh, working on the boundary making and ethnic exclusion, exclusion inclusion between imperial and post colonial production of history and memory, and that will be the case of Georgia, and very very close to Georgia, Abkhazia, which is right now uh, uh, part of the of, of Russia, occupied by Russia. So those are our three fellows, um, Roxolana, Jan, and Markas. And uh, to all of you who are there and, uh, and want to ask questions, you are welcome to, um, to, to send us um, questions by chat. But in the meantime, we don't know, even know whether we'll have time, but to, to try. Um, so Roxolana, why won't you start? Because we never know how long you are going to have this electricity in Lviv, right? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm very glad to be here, considering all the uh, <laughs> situation here. And thank you, Ajbeta and Lala, for organizing this. And thank you, Professor Padrai, uh, for your lecture. Uh, so as a Ukrainian, I, of course, wanted to dive deeper in the last uh, section of your lecture uh, about nationalism in Ukraine and so on. And I, I totally uh, understand uh, the uh, like concern about Ukrainian nationalism. And uh, here is uh, like 
I, I, I even uh, felt like a pinch of guilt, you know, <laughs> as being uh, uh, like a potential nationalism. And yes, uh, I think uh, when Russia attacked Ukraine, ev everything like, you know, became uh, more black and white here. Uh, and uh, I think we all became like a sort of uh, bigger nationalists, uh, even those who were leftists. Uh, um before the war so uh but at the same time there are interesting things uh coming up here in ukraine for example um uh, uh for the uh, like for the first time in uh, last 10 years there was a successful attempt to uh ratify the istanbul convention uh and uh, also i know that uh uh, there was a petition to legalize LGBT uh, marriage in Ukraine, which was, uh, as far as I know, like uh, approved by the president. So there are like some uh, positive tendencies uh, that I see um, along with uh, this uh, situation. When you know uh, there are some like right wing activists, uh, which are not a very uh, numerous <laughs> crowd here in Ukraine. Uh, but they were visible before the war and now they are fighting Russians and, you know, they will return here as heroes. Mm -hmm. And like uh, in many ways, it will be true because they fight like uh, Russians uh, like very heroically uh, most of the way. So, uh, yes, there's this ambiguity and uh, this was just a comment I wanted to bring on this conversation. And... Uh, maybe my question uh would be you know uh i think about uh, this elitist uh thesis you bring uh and uh, uh i think about people's agency in uh, this situation because you know it's a case of russia for example uh when their main argument is uh, that people are innocent and the elite is doing all the stuff in ukraine mm -hmm. although like uh the soldiers who are committing genocide here are like people. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, my question maybe, where is people's agency in this situation? How could we uh, find it? Hmm. Should I respond briefly? Yeah, I think we should, we, should, we should do it this way. I think we have, we have comfortable margin of time. Yeah, and, and the thing is, if I listen to many things, then I will lose track of some sort. It's right. It's I, right. I'll, I'll try and go uh, along without uh, taking up too much time, but at least uh, making sure that uh, our uh, colleagues like uh, Rokshalana, not Rokshana, but Rokshalana, oh. yeah. It may be different because in India and Pakistan and Iran, we have Rokshana which is of course a related name. So that's a different question. Uh, but uh, thank you uh, both for your observation. Uh, my uh, question, my, my comment about Ukrainian nationalism was just cautionary because I think it's a generic problem. Whether it's France, Germany, US, there is no inoculation against what in some early work I call predatory nationalism. So there's always inclusive nationalism, liberatory nationalism, emancipatory, but then the lurking inside is a virus, which is predatory nationalism, which is where my national means you must die. <laughs> that little virus, I believe, is always there. So one has to watch carefully in any situation uh, how to keep track of that, uh, that particular uh, potential. So it's just a, a, a small worry. Uh, given the otherwise obvious asymmetry and uh, and uh, clarity of the Ukrainian cause in relation to uh, Russia and Putin, Putin's Russia, but still there's a little worry later because if you think of these people now, I'm I'm speaking out of turn because I don't know much about this area, this region. But if you think of Donbass and so on, the question is, did these people choose from day one, I am Russian, I am Ukraine? I mean, these, these are things where you are forced to declare yourself. I know this from my case of uh, my dear colleague and spouse, Gabika Vorskaya, whom 
uh, as, as Beata knows and who as Beata has also taught long ago, that in uh, the Balkans, people who are products of mixed marriages had to pick a side. Mm -hmm. They weren't born saying, I'm Serbian, I'm this, I'm that. They had to declare something. And whether the blood was mixed or the bodies were mixed, they had to declare things. In the contested parts of the region now at war between Ukraine and Russia, there are so many people who have to, under duress, declare one identity. See, this is the beginning of the national thing. The Russian one is established. The Ukrainian one is established. But there are lots of people who have moved, who are mixed, who speak both languages. I mean, I know people in Germany who are Ukrainians who speak Russian, but also German. I mean, these, these are not people who woke up, you know, or were born with a passport and singing the national anthem. They were moved here and there. So all I'm saying is, we need to be mindful of that. And of course, uh, Putin's highly evolved uh, version of Russian nationalism has already processed a lot of this uh, this into a solid thing with anchors in Kiev as the seat of the Russian Empire, with the Russian Orthodox Church. I do believe Putin is worried about something big, not just uh, his power. But I, let me go quickly to your question. The people, how do they get enlisted? It's a big, big, big problem. And I think the answer is not one thing, but many things. People get persuaded because of some uh, something they have suffered immediately. For example, neighbors who have attacked them and so on, but also because their expectations are rising. That's the opposite. It's not because anybody has done anything, but because they want more. You know, they are seeing the good life here and there. So in, in the old days, there was a sociological idea called revolution of rising expectations. I see you're so rich, why can't I be? Which is not about somebody killed me, hurt me, wounded me. It's because I want more. So. There are many, many reasons, but I would certainly say it's not a simple thing to answer why people, let's say, sign on, either to heroic causes or to horrible causes, as in the Hitler case with the famous book, Hitler's Willing Executioners. We know every 100 meters, there were people who signed on to the work of the camps. If you, look, you see a picture of the camps in Germany, they're everywhere. So the idea that people didn't know is plainly absurd. But what were they signing on to? How did they disguise some things from themselves? How did they do all this is an open and important question, but it should not be ignored. So I, I would just say elites are involved. And I, of course, everybody uses this against others. Oh, it's a Ukrainian elite, it's not the people. The people really want to be with us. It's just these elites. The Ukrainians will also say it's Putin's people. It's not the actual Russians, but the truth is there are people involved on both sides and the elites, but we should not ignore the fact that there is some thing involving elites and their wish to replace each other, which is going on today. Uh, but it should not exclude the question of ordinary people. And how do they sign on, either in the best way or the worst way? So that remains an open question, which we all need to struggle with. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, we may be able to come back. You know, we'll see how we are going to do with the with the with the with the time. But if you if you urgently want to ask a question, uh, Roxolana, you just you just raise your hand. Uh, John, John, our fellow from 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 Turkey, who is uh, uh, right now in New York, where he teaches at Lang as doctoral st student in sociology. John, hi, um, professor. Thank you for the talk. Um, I I really learned a lot from it. And uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe I'm gonna, you know, I should start with uh, uh, your point on the democracy fatigue, um, because I know that you're, you're in, you know, uh, I was under the impression that this talk was gonna be more about India versus Turkey, because I had that in mind. Uh, you know, when, when you look at the title, I know that Turkey is coming up and I'm from Turkey. So I wanted to ask you a question about that specifically. Um, so for one, uh, you know, to experience democracy fatigue, uh, one, you know, should uh, at least start with the assumption that we did experience democracy before, right? <laughs> so uh, to me, the idea of democracy fatigue in relation to uh, our experience with Erdogan 
is uh, you know interesting to think about because you know I understand in the recent shift to global right uh, in uh, you know in many uh, countries like France like Italy um, you can understand that these recent shifts are uh, because of the water frustration right I, I do understand that thesis uh, or uh, you know that that point but in a country like Turkey uh, or India or Hungary where you know that uh, it is persistent, right? It's not, it's not just a recent shift. And for Turkey, it's been going on for like two decades uh, for, uh, you know, for, for years. And the question becomes, uh, Ashveta in the beginning uh, mentioned the hopeful alternatives, right? And uh, for me, the question becomes, uh, what, is, what is the other alternative, which is just, you know, this becomes a persistent issue where the people do not just vote themselves out of democracy, but also want to stay in because they don't see the alternative. They don't have any belief in the alternative uh, because the alternative is just as undemocratic as uh, you know the undemocratic times that we're living in right now. Uh, so that's uh, one of my questions, uh, and or maybe you know in the form of a, a comment, uh, and I would be happy to you know hear your thoughts about it. And the second one is tangentially related maybe, but I, I know your works on, you know, nation states mm. and especially in like early nineties, you were one of the first ones to uh, warn us against this crisis of the nation, right? And uh, the, you know, you uh, were the, uh, one of the earliest, uh, like one of the first scholars in the early nineties to propose that we need to move beyond uh, the nation, the understanding of the nation. And that you know there are different or like newly emerging forms of uh, sovereignties, like the multinational movements, transnational organizations, NGOs, right? So I wanted to ask you, thirty years after, yeah. you know, that scholarship, and you know, now that we are seeing this recent shift uh, towards uh, right-wing politicians and right-wing parties, uh, can we uh, now talk about the you know? Uh, cycle you know being you know like 30 years 40 years after that post national scholarship can we now say that uh, the nation states are back uh, or is it still a new form of sovereignty that we are still you know trying to uh, process trying to understand but yeah thank you so much well thank you very much uh, john uh, indeed uh, i do have a a, a considerable interest, uh, which is only matched by my ignorance about Turkey. <laughs> uh, and I have to tell you that my main rich source is the great uh, TV serials that come out of Turkey, which I watch with great interest, including uh, the whole uh, uh, fantasy about Ertogrul, which has now come to Pakistan. Did you know that Ertogrul, the great TV series about uh, the founder of the Ottoman Empire is now hugely popular in Pakistan. So this is a very important and very interesting. What is happening here? What is this kind of new Ottoman business? Uh, in Turkey, it makes sense, but Pakistan? Wow. Uh, next thing you come to India, uh, but I'll come back to that in a minute. But uh, I think actually on your comment, very interesting comment. The democracy fatigue is fine if you've experienced democracy, but <laughs> where is the fatigue if you've never had it? Well, my answer to that is we should rethink the comparison between US, France, Italy, Germany, the great centers of democracy, we think, and India. So India is 75 years now. I first point that out. So how old is democracy in Germany? Let's do the mathematics. <laughs> India was, became independent in 1947, today is 1922. So, and they've had a lively judiciary, uh, separation of powers, highly proactive constitution from 1947. So it's not a short history. On the other hand, look at the European countries. Every time I look closely at the history of Europe, I find the history is shorter. When it became a nation, oh, it was Bismarck. Well, actually, it was not Bismarck. It was Germany. It was actually in uh, at the end of the 19th century. Well, actually, 
you know, then the First World War came, so there was never a moment. So actually it shrinks. Go to Poland, as Beata's country. Well, you look very long and hard, but let's not bring up the Balkans because that's, we know, the, the, the dark side of the fantasy of Western Europe. You know, these are the savages of Europe in, in the Balkans. So let's not bring up that, but let's go for the core. France, Germany, England. They all have extremely short histories. I mean, England is crying over the damn monarch. Now, what kind of democracy is this? When it's falling apart. Uh, so honestly, my view is that even in temporal terms, uh, and if you think of Turkey, based on my eighth grade knowledge of Turkey, you know, Ataturk is the modernizer. I mean, he was not yesterday. <laughs> That's quite a long time. It's approaching a century. When it's true, he was a forceful guy. He was somewhat uh, autocratic himself. He connected to the military and all, but he was not an Ottoman king. In his view, he was replacing the Ottomans. He was going somewhere else. He was a modernizer. He was this. So was Nasser. So was Sukarno. So was Nehru. I mean, the thing is, these histories are not as different. So I would say. In all these places, democracy is not that long of an experience. <laughs> Look at the US, when did women get the vote? Where are blacks? I mean, so democracy is not going back 400 years or 300 years, even in the US, it's quite short. So, so I think we should correct the, the comparative chronological terms, but more important and more seriously, I think people can have fatigue even after very short experience. Sometimes they can have fatigue especially after a short experience, because they've not learned the question of wait and wait. So when it's short, they can get impatient faster. But we have a big question is places like uh, China and Russia. Why is there not more democracy fatigue? That is fatigue with combined with aspiration. That is what has happened to that syndrome that you keep waiting and waiting and waiting, because God knows in Russia, <laughs> people have been waiting forever. I mean, there's a lot of humor about this. The whole of Eastern Europe, people are still waiting. People began to wait under Stalin, and they are still in the queue, waiting for butter and meat. You know, so when will it end? So the point is, the question is, why in some places, the uh, exhaustion, the impatience with whatever is offered, even the fake forms of participation that are offered in China and Russia. And by the way, we do need to look closely because all those places have some form of representation. I mean, Xi Jinping has to answer to the whole party. 20,000 people meet and they represent millions of party members. He can't ignore them. So even he has some kind of accountability. And I'm not an expert in Russia, but Putin also has to manage all kinds of constituencies, though it's not you know, in the kind of US small town model where people can raise their hands and speak, but he has to manage very large things. So in short, what I would say, your questions are, and comments are, are wonderful, but I would say that we need to slightly correct uh, the terms of the comparison, as far as the nation state goes, I'll just say quickly one thing, my views then and now, of course, I see now that my hopes about the initial post-1989 uh, kind of uh, hopes that many of us had have been damned and crashed again and again, not only by uh, the Balkans in 1990s, Rwanda, and so on and so forth, but by uh, the, the whole neoliberal process, by the medication applied by Jeffrey Sachs, especially in Poland and Russia, who is now the friend of the poor in Africa. When that happened, somebody I hope will explain to me the magic plastic surgery where Dr. Sachs became, you know, the great friend of the world's poor, having ruined Eastern Europe and Russia systematically by saying, you know, just destroy all your institutions and capitalism will come and save you. Well, right, we know, we know what happened. So uh, my feeling is today, we still see very deep problems with the nation form and the nation state. 
But the question, where will the alternatives come from, has to be rethought. And I'll give you one concrete answer, that if we go to the great heritage of, of Marx, which is one of the big answers, class across the world should be more important than nations, whether it's Germany, France, here or there. That's Marx at his best, shall we say. Not you know the anti-Semitic Marx, the anti-Indian Marx. Let's leave all that aside for a moment. And say my personal view is that class won't, and I've written a bit about this, that we need to rethink actually the question of uh, what today's classes are about. And people have tried to do that. I'm not the first, but we need a different picture of that so that we can rethink this, uh, the theory of, of social movements, collective action. But if we are still located in volume one of Capital, that is hard to do because the world has changed. It's digital, it's financial, it's this and that. So we will be speaking for 20 people who are still in a union somewhere, either in Massachusetts or in Gdansk. But most other people are in some other world, other economy. For them, we need a theory of exclusion and exploitation. So anyway, now I'm giving a, a speech as if I'm running for office, but just <laughs> there is a way to go, but I think it will take a lot of, uh, not just political work, but analytic work, because it's rethinking the idea of class is not a, I mean, that's a, that's a big mountain, but you know, we have to consider it, we have to take it on. Arjun, come back and run for the office. We need, we need, <laughs> we need some democrats here. Um, uh, God and, bless you. Yeah, right. The world would really go for a crash at that point. <laughs> um, I, 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 I have a question. Can you please make sure you have incredibly expressive eyes? But we would like to see all your face, if you can just... Really? Yeah, I, I think my screen is okay. still thinking. Yes, right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> tend to both much. push my screen away and begin to tilt and soon yeah. you'll see ah, right. my non-existent <laughs> hair or my chin yeah. or something. So yeah, please remind me. Okay. Thank you. No, wonderful. So here we have Malkas. And Malkas, as uh, I said, it's from Tbilisi. And you know, we we usually have very short memory, but remember in 2008, the first war that had happened, the first invasion was really was really the invasion of Georgia. Um, so Marcus uh, Toria, historian and um, and um, and sociologist uh, from both Tbilisi and now from the New School. Go ahead, Mar as well as from the region with with our dear friend uh, the Marshal Stalin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not really proud of that. <laughs> Let us not forget. We cannot forget. But anyway, again, I need two minutes, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, let me just let me just do a little bit of upkeep here. We do have very interesting questions also um, 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 on chat, and uh, I will see. I, I, I will try to figure out how to manage it. But if you guys may like to respond to each other things, I will first give you that that chance uh, to each other comments or to or, or to whatever had happened in in the meantime, whatever uh, Arjun brought in. Um, I, I wanted to say that um, the, 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 the question expands this very fascinating take on, on the shifts that you know, are happening in, fr in front of, our, um, of, 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 of us right now. So, um, so we, will, we will do that. If you, have, if, you have, um, if you want to return briefly to, please do. Otherwise, there are very specific questions from people, from, from people who are with us today. And I see somebody from Colombia and somebody from NYU and uh, and somebody from and Olesia Markovich <laughs> uh, from from Ukraine and so and I yes um, and there is a student from the University of Delhi and I think we will we will have to ask that question so uh, so as soon as um, as Arjun comes back I really apologize want to apologize for us beginning the whole thing a little bit late but it was very difficult to get to webinar for some of us and um, once we managed to do that. It was already seven or ten minutes after after the, the time, so that's why we we may like to uh, take Arjun on his word and actually do this little extension of that of of uh, of ten minute extension perhaps of our of our meeting here. Yeah, I'm reading some of those things. Um, maybe I should read it to you so you know what what people are thinking. Um, Pratima Agnihorti is um, Agnihot, 
Hotri is asking, do elites basically come from patriarchal mindset? In other words, how do you explain the Iran turn to the right? Actually, it is hardly a, 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 run, a, a turn though. Um, Luisa, Luisa, Barbarossa. Here we have, yes. We are, we are, we are, I, I was just screening the questions, which are also interesting asked by our people. But uh, here you have our Georgian, uh, Georgian um, yes. fellow, uh, Malkas, here. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Afadurai, I really appreciate this really opportunity, not only to attend your talk, but also ask a couple of questions. Uh, my first question is about the applicability of the post-colonial or post-imperial model to certain areas, because there are discussions about this. Are they relevant beyond the British or French imperialism, for instance, right? Uh, specifically, it would be interesting to hear your insight on how to conceptualize uh, this, uh, the former Tsarist and uh, post-Soviet realm, right? Why I'm asking this? Because many authors here in the West, including in the West, justify the Soviet Union as some sort of uh, more just power. Because um, they see Soviet Union was more inclusive, uh, that allowed nations to be represented and to be more accommodated in terms of power sharing or economic benefits or structural equalities, et cetera. So, but um, my question would be, is it really something special here? Because we know that all empires are, are more of the similar structure, the asymmetric structure, right? Of incorporation of different uh, imperial subjects. Correct. So uh, it, it won't be uh, any new to say that on, um, so only real power was the center metropole. And it exercised only encompassing power. It 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 uh, had the capability of uh, power to decide, right? And um, and these people mentioned, right? Like, a, for instance, um, providing railways in India or opening universities. Yes. You know, all these sort of uh, um, positive positive uh, uh, results of imperialism. Uh, so uh, and. I would like to focus because I, I read uh, uh, some of your work and you kind of emphasize of culture. Culture is a sort of phenomenon, very important, mm -hmm. right? So om omnipotence of cultural influence. For instance, talking about Ukraine, uh, Ukraine, right? Ukrainian, we are a really key uh, segment of uh, Soviet Union, right? Almost bilingual, Slavic people. Uh, that is why Putin claims they are Russians and denies any sort of individuality of Ukrainian nation, right? And any historical right of statehood and separate history. Uh, and this sort of claim for sameness or homogenizing tendency, right? Through the politics of culture, identity, history, memory, of the so-called Russian world, right? We, we have this. Um, uh, and uh, this is achieved more, more uh, by cultural means rather than just direct coercion. This is very important. And now what we are witnessing in Ukraine is a, is a sort of uh, uh, find, uh, reaffirming Ukrainianness as a, as, a, as, a, as a political or cultural body, which is very, very important. So I, my question would be, following this, uh, how to navigate between left and right discussion while speaking about Putin, how, how to or should we avoid the dichotomic model of American imperialism or Putin a hero dichotomy, for instance? Because we, 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 we hear uh, that there's a red line should be respected. And here comes also the issue of agency, which Roxolana already mentioned, right? We are local voices. Why, uh, for some authors and politicians, until recently, they they did not, they were not concerned about global emancipation, as you mentioned, concerning former subjects of Russia, like Ukrainians and Georgians, right, which I represent here today. And second question would be, why the crisis of liberalism is an opportunity only for right or mainly for right? Because we are uh, witnessing um, ethnocentric and exclusive nationalism, ethno, uh, ethno religious nationalism, even, right? Right wing populism, conservatism, anti LGBT propaganda, 
and generally a whole spectrum of anti-democracy uh, movements. On the other hand, we are witnessing the revival of, revival of Marxian reading of the world, world, right? Present or the past. However, even leftists are leaning toward nat nativism and even quasi-religious stance, especially, and, and I would provide the example of so-called ecological movement, right? When uh, they, they won't bring progressive forces together. Ethnocentric and ethno-religious nationalism seems to be expanding toward the realm, this realm too. And some author uh, says that populism are also greening, right? Green movements and embracing eco-national chauvinism. They propose to preserve their own green spaces and natural resources by excluding racialized others. You know, and, and in Georgia, it happens. They had some ecological movements and they use this paraphernalia of cultural symbols like a cross, Orthodox Christianity, and nationalism, um, you know, all this sort of. So going back to Ukraine and Georgia and Russia context, and I will conclude now. Putin's Syria <laughs> subline included Soviet Stalin on nostalgia too. Mm -hmm. But he's not left at all. He's a chef, chief of oligarchic system, right? Wow. And uh, he's a patron of anti-Western and LGBT rhetoric of Russian world, as I mentioned. This. So again, why the right see themselves as to substitute liberalism? Why nationally so powerful? I mean, uh, national ethnocentric. That would be my question. Thank you. <laughs> well. Uh... Thank you, and I see a thread uh, through your points, though there, there are different ones uh, about uh, nationalism, about left versus right, about uh, particularly the imperial question. That's where you began, that you know, the whole post-colonialism discussion does not come out of Russia or China, or for that matter, Japan, which had a huge imperial ambition uh, not so long ago, you know, uh, 100 years, 120 years, uh, but typically came out of the European conquest of much of the world that began, uh, the first phase was from 1500, and the second phase was, let's say, from 1800. There were a small number of European countries, basically dominated about 80% of the world, more or less. It's not a huge amount of time, but it's a very noteworthy amount of time. And that is the place that launched the idea of decolonization and uh, of emancipatory nationalism, Fanon, this one, that one. So you are perfectly right to ask how do other places fit this paradigm? And we may say not only there is Russia, which obviously has a huge imperial past, really quite long and quite old. Uh, China, my God, you know, that's 3,000 years of you know, some kind of imperial rule over somebody by somebody. Uh, Turkey, I mean, Turkey is the last small remnant of the Ottomans and they are very unhappy that they are left with one small bit. So when Erdogan looks to Erdogan and the Ottoman fantasy is because he sees this as a terrible reduction of Turkey from this huge power to this tiny thing. And I, frankly, I think if you even move further west to someone like Orban, here I offer a, uh, a uh, a free speculation without any cost to the audience that Orban will soon begin to talk even more about Majas and how they ruled from here to there and Hunas and this and that, that will come. It will not be only about Hungary, the nation state, and we should do this and that. It will soon become a kind of more imperial idea because it's not so long ago that Hungary was part of a big formation Austro-Hungarians and the Hungarians were different from the Austros. So, so the imperial question of the pre-capitalist, uh, pre non-capitalist uh, uh, imperial formations and what is their current situation and their fate is very complicated. But let me cut right to Russia 
And see, in the case of a place like Russia, what you have is a kind of layering. It's a kind of uh, uh, cake where you have the imperial layer, which is the czarist formation, uh, very large. Russian empire was incredibly huge uh, with anchors in the Orthodox Church and Kiev and so on. So Kiev was clearly central to that formation. The question is today, what is the standing of that? But factually, Kiev was Kiev. It was part of something. So what I'm seeing is in the Russian case, on top of that, then you have a, the Soviet empire, and now you have Russia as a global neoliberal autocratic power. So there are three, four layers, and, and Putin is like a, uh, a musician playing all of them when it suits him, going back to the czars, coming up to the present, talking about this, talking about that. He's very, very good, but, but, but structurally, the fact is he, Russia, to use the proper name of the country, is not an easy formation to describe simply as a modern nation state because it also has clear roots in its older Soviet past and its older imperial past. I mean, I believe a lot of people who made recent comments in journals like Foreign Policy that say that the real threat to Putin is the ideas of the enlightenment from France, England, and so on. They're coming too close. They are dangerous for him. So it's not even uh, NATO or arms or this or that. It is the threat that was always a threat to the Russian empire, which is these ideas that came out around the end of the 18th century in the far west of Europe, which if carried to their extreme, are fatal to the current power structure in which Putin operates. So, so I believe in this longer view that that's the actual panic or hysteria, although there may be some real politic also involved, but rather than wander off into that, let me just quickly say that I think uh, there are two ways to think about the whole uh, concept of post-colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something actually I don't use much. If you have read my work, you'll see I don't use it in every other sentence. You know, there are others, some of whom share my national identity who have written about it a lot. But I was actually trained in the study of colonialism and that too, British colonialism in Africa. So I'm actually coming from where you come from, which is that this is for those places. So what the heck are we doing with it on a worldwide basis? Now, here's my answer to that, that we need to recognize that the history that produced this idea need not be the full owner. People can take it because they also want to go somewhere. It's about what they want, not just their prior experience. So the idea of post-colonial, post-imperial world is helpful, not only for people in Crimea, Georgia, Ukraine, uh, or in different parts of India or Pakistan, whatever, or in the US, which has nothing to do with this earlier history in the, in the strict sense, but it's a map. It's not about the history. Were you ruled this way, that way? Was it just like the British? No, it's more about where do you want to go? And in that, this idea seems to play a role. And I, I, don't, want to, uh, I don't want to be in the position to say, well, you know, you should use that idea in Russia because really it's an African idea or it's an Indian idea. My view is if you have a reason, go for it. Uh, but it should be analytic, it should be serious, it should be based on analysis of what is the nature of the power you're trying to struggle against. But at the end of the day, as I said about Ukraine or all the other emancipating powers, Palestinians, Kashmiris, all the good people of the world, as opposed to the bad people, the good people, once they are you know, in place, then I want to know who will they fight and crush and squeeze, because the form is like that. It's not their form. <laughs> the form is like that. So I re keep returning. We need an answer. And I think the left has failed to go to your last question, because there are many reasons. But one which persuades me is the right has ca captured affect, emotion, feeling. That is 100% captured by the right. 
we sit with you know analysis of the manuscripts of Marx in the 1844 and did this happen and writing in Jacobin and New Left Review. Who cares? We have no crowds, nobody listening. And one of the reasons is not because you know those are bad people and we are good people. We have nothing to say which captures people's emotional life. So that's my answer. Why is the right run away with all this? Is yeah, you can say it's the nature of capitalism, this, that, and the other, but I also think it's because the left has failed to make any move to capture the realm of emotion, affect, mm -hmm. feeling. You cannot have a Puritan view of that. You will fail <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if you do that. And I think collectively that has happened, not because people decided it, but it's just the way Things have gone, but that's just my personal, you know, little opinion about why the right has beaten us hollow, you know. Um, thank you, Ajron. Make sure that we see your face again because it's oh, sorry, it's we, uh, yeah. 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 we have a few more minutes. We have yes. only a few more minutes, and I made an executive decision and I looked at the questions, and this is what I suggest there is a comment by our Ukrainian fellows that I fellow who is not here in that in that um, oh, in the yes. panel that I'm going to read. It's a comment. Yes. And then there is um there is a kind of a question that you may like to hear. I believe it comes from India, from an Indian scholar. And um, so let's just do that. There's a question in the comment. The comment is from uh, Olesia Markovic and um, just she says just a quick comment. I think that the concern regarding predatory nationalism in post-war Ukraine is very much exaggerated. If you look at people who defend Ukraine now, you will see all ethnicities. Ukrainians um, defend Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians, Ukrainians, Ukrainians speaking and Russian speaking, Russians holding Ukrainian citizenship, Ukrainian okay. Hungarians, Crimean Tatars, etc. They are not divided by faith, ethnicity or language. On the contrary, they are united by the common values, among which is readiness to protect Ukrainian state against the remnants of totalitarian empire. So a possibility of uh, which hand of others in post-war Ukraine is very unlikely, says Olesha. That's a comment. Um, I'm going to read the name of the person who is asking the, uh, one of the questions, I believe from India, but I'm not sure. It could be Pakistan, of course, too. Habib Sabhan says, you talked about the danger of nationalism. You said nationalism is linked to ethnicity. Now, Fanon advocates the idea of national culture and national consciousness. If um, a nation is to protect itself from any form of colonialism or imperialism. My question is, how do you see this contradiction in the context of India in the present time? How the present elites in power in India negotiate the global elite? Um, your idea of democracy fatigue in a de decolonized, I'm sorry, just, I just lost it, in the in decolonized nation in the context of a possible theocratic form of governance. governance. Thank you. I'll just quickly try to say something useful or mm -hmm. moderately intelligent to both these things, but just flag me the first one again because I was listening carefully. So the, fir the, fir the first question was a question about um, the, 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 the pluralism of Ukrainian. Ah, yeah. So Ukrainians, good. Right? Thank you. Uh, right it's a world. very important and uh, extremely uh, aff affirming, hope affirming comment. And it's something I'm not informed about because it's not what you read. Mm -hmm you know, yeah. in the New Yorker and from, I won't name the names, but the people who are our usual sources, even of great long form journalism, this is not a point has jumped out at me, but it's extremely helpful. The only thing I can say, and I don't want to be either a devil's advocate or a kind of, uh, you know, doom doomsayer or a, a negative person is, you know, think of, uh, again, the region I know because of my dear colleague and wife, Gavika Bochka, Yugoslavia had all these qualities. And then in 1991, everybody was killing everybody overnight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and it was not that Tito assembled all these groups in, for two years. He did it for 
almost 40 years. 40 years. Yeah. And then the killing was merciless. Now, of course, I'm not saying it's because people were like that. There were hundreds of factors, global forces, NATO, this, that, you know, people like Robert Hayden, constitutionalism, there's a umpteen things, but at the end of the road, the, the Rome is, you know, that, that things can go wrong. And I, my own diagnosis always is that whether it's a very slow disease of a certain kind of nationalism that say in Germany began after the losses in World War I, then it went through Weimar, then this and that, slightly longer story. In Yugoslavia overnight. So all I say is the good news is good, but how to protect it? How to nurture it? So that's that's my quick comment on, on that. And the second question is a little more tricky because it's about connecting places like India to the world. And I would just say again, at the risk of great simplification, that there are really two issues, which is one is how does a place like India, which has a very strong constitution and a long history of democratic separation of powers, free and independent press, strong judiciary, not just for one week, I mean, for 50 years, <laughs> you know, go this way. It's a, it's a question that deeply troubles me. I don't have a simple answer, nor does anybody in India have a simple answer. But that's one question. How do you go from that yeah. to this? Uh, the other question is, how do you come to terms with the world? And the answer there is that the new autocrats also want to be big global powers, economically and politically speaking. So they, and I've written about this quite a lot, there's a hydraulic relationship. The more they want to be global politically, the more they become culturally uh, exclusive. So they are culturally nationalists while they become global players in arms trade and economy. So none of them wants to be just national. So places like Burma even, extreme closure, still have trade. China, this one, that one, they keep that little valve open. And places like India, openly. Turkey, openly. They want to be big regional and world powers, but culturally, strong walls, borders, fortresses. So I would say the dealing with other elites is on the terrain of political economy. When it comes to culture, we are us. You are you. Good luck. You know? So on that note, Elzbieta, I must now say goodbye with the greatest yes. luck since it's such yes. a lovely discussion. We squeeze a lot of out, out of you and uh, we, we, we want really very much to thank you. And I hope you are going to go to the other room and have a, a glass of red wine with Gabika. I might, uh, or just have dinner and go to sleep. But either way, uh, I am happy to have been here. I thank all the people who spoke, as well as the people who uh, made comments through chat or just simply attended and listened. And of course, uh, thank you and uh, uh, your dear colleague, the other Elzbieta, uh, uh, for organizing this and colleagues whom I may not know who may have been responsible for the infrastructure of this event. So thank you very good much. Good luck and enjoy thank the you. rest of your thank you.